2. Against Erasmus It was in his debate with Erasmus that Luther's thinking came to its sharpest focus. Erasmus, in his diatribe or sermon concerning will, approached the subject moralistically, pragmatically, and anthropologically. The approach of Erasmus was also Pelagian. It was not exegetical. Erasmus was not concerned with accepting what Scripture taught and faithfully interpreting it. His concern was to save the freedom of the will. As against Luther, he declared, It is not at all true that those who trust in their own works are driven by the spirit of Satan and delivered to damnation. Erasmus held that There are several places in Scripture which obviously ascribe contingency to God, yes, even a certain mutability. Moreover, in his preface, Erasmus, the ostensible champion of free will and reason, attacked propositional truth. He spoke of his great dislike of assertions, which he declared to be so great, that I prefer the views of the sceptics whenever the inviolable authority of Scripture and the decisions of the Church permit. Erasmus felt that Holy Scripture contains secrets into which God does not want us to penetrate too deeply, because if we attempt to do so, increasing darkness envelops us, so that we might come to recognize in this manner both the unfathomable majesty of divine wisdom and the feebleness of the human mind. This humble language concealed the reality, because for him God had both a contingency and a mutability. There was thus no certain knowledge, because a conditional, changeable God could not have established an absolute decree in certain knowledge. Propositional truth, assertions, must give way to hypotheses, because the universe is not the total handiwork of an absolute God. Packer and Johnson stated it succinctly when they described free will in Erasmus' sense as an inherent power in man to act apart from God. Luther's answer to Erasmus, on the bondage of the will, De Servo Arbitrio, 1525, is clearly Luther's greatest work and one of the greatest documents in the history of thought. Luther met Erasmus' attack on propositional truth head-on. The assertion in question, he pointed out, is the assertion of what has been delivered to us from above in the sacred scripture. Moreover, take away assertions and you take away Christianity. As for Erasmus's preference for the skeptic's position, most Christians could talk like that. The absolute God of Scripture speaks with perspicuity in Scripture. As for Erasmus's definition of free will, Luther declared, This is the kind of definition that the sophists call vicious, that is, one in which the definition fails to cover the thing defined. For I showed above that free will belongs to none but God only. You are no doubt right in assigning to man a will of some sort, but to credit him with a will that is free in the things of God is too much. For all who hear mention of free will take it to mean in its proper sense a will that can do and does do Godward all that it pleases, restrained by no law and no command, for you would not call a slave who acts at the beck and call of his lord free. But in that case... How much less are we right to call men or angels free, for they live under the complete mastery of God, not to mention sin and death, and cannot continue by their own strength for a moment. The issue was God or man. Does man have an autonomy from God, or to any degree, or is man totally God's creature, and entirely under God's government? When Erasmus spoke of free will, he did not mean what is commonly understood by that term, that is, that man is a responsible creature. Instead, he meant, as do all the tiresome intellectuals who trumpet free will, the autonomy of man from God, a radically different concept. Luther bluntly and discerningly cited the implications of Erasmus's position. Erasmus informs us then that free will is a power of the human will which can of itself will and not will the word and work of God by which it is to be led to those things that exceed its grasp and comprehension. 
If it can will and not will, it can also love and hate, and if it can love and hate, it can in measure keep the law and believe the gospel. For if you can will and not will, it cannot be that you are not able by that will of yours to do some part of a work, even though another should prevent your being able to complete it. Now, since death, the cross, and all the evils of the world are numbered among the works of God that lead to salvation, the human will will thus be able to will its own death and perdition. Yes, it can will all things when it can will the contents of the word and work of God. What can be anywhere below, above, within or without the word and work of God except God himself? But what is here left to grace and the Holy Ghost? This is plainly to ascribe divinity to free will, for to will the law and the gospel, not to will sin and to will death, is possible to divine power alone, as Paul says in more places than one. Which means that nobody since the Pelagians has written of free will more correctly than Erasmus, for I have said above that free will is a divine term and signifies a divine power. But no one to date except the Pelagians has ever assigned to it much power. The sophists, whatever their views, certainly do not say anything like this. Why, Erasmus far outdoes the very Pelagians, for they ascribe this divinity to the whole of free will, while Erasmus ascribes it to half only. The Pelagians posit two parts of free will, a power of discernment and a power of choice attributing the one to the reason and the other to the will, and the sophists do the same. But Erasmus sets aside the power of discernment and exalts the power of choice alone. Thus he makes a lame, half-free will into a god. What do you think he would have done had he set out to describe the whole of free will? To all practical intent, the god of Erasmus's diatribe was simply another name for that idle chance under whose sway all things happen at random. Luther pointed out that the divine freedom implies human necessity. The primacy of determination is absolutely and wholly God's. Yet God does not work in us without us, for he created and preserves us for this very purpose, that we might work in us and we might cooperate with him. Whether that occurs outside his kingdom by his general omnipotence, or within his kingdom by the special power of his spirit.